Hi friends, welcome to Raising Lifelong Learners. I'm your host, Colleen Kessler, and this is the podcast where I encourage you to trust yourself and your differently wired kiddos as you help cultivate their curiosity, encourage them to discover the world around them, embrace who they are wired to be, all while helping them discover their passions, interests, and raise them to become the amazing adults they're meant to be. Hey, 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 welcome back. This is episode 211, and I'm here today talking again with Sarah Collins from homeschoolot.com. We're talking about a different kind of topic today. We're talking about what it's like as a parent who has our own kind of sensory needs and challenges, and what it's like to have to self-regulate when we're homeschooling neurodivergent kiddos who also have challenges with regulation and you know how that sometimes can trigger our own challenges and then maybe trigger our kids again and the cycle keeps going on and on. So Sarah's going to give us some tips so that when we start to feel like we're struggling with our own kids and their challenges and it's triggering our own personal challenges, we can do something about it and be proactive ourselves. It's a really interesting conversation, and I'm sure that you're going to love it. So quick shout out to CTC Math. Thanks again, as always, for being our season-long sponsor. We're so grateful for your support. Check them out at ctcmath.com. And now, let's get on with today's episode. Pop those earbuds in, take a walk, and store up all of the great things that you learn to help you become a better self-regulated homeschool mama. Here we go. Okay, so welcome back, Sarah. We're here again with Sarah Collins from Homeschool OT. I'm so glad that you agreed to do another talk with me. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I I just love having conversation and I love coming back because then that way I feel like we can dive deeper into so many topics. You and I said before, you know, occupational therapy in itself, but we just said, we're going to do one podcast on that. It would have been hours and hours and hours. So I love being able that we can kind of break some things down and, and go together. Yeah, I love that too. And we were just talking before we started recording that the the topic that we're talking about today is probably going to actually take two episodes. We're going to follow up. So um, we'll be meeting to record again. And if you're listening, it actually might even work out and be back to back. So that's our hope. We'll see how (laughs) how that goes. But we're going to dive into one aspect of this topic today and then on another episode. So you're not, you know, bogged down for five hours listening to this. Uh, But before we get started, for those of you who are new tuning in and maybe didn't hear the previous episode that we've had with Sarah, Sarah, why don't you take a minute and introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. So again, my name is Sarah Collins and I'm an occupational therapist and also a fellow homeschool mom. We started homeschooling in 2017 purely because of, you know, the timing of a move, but then it actually worked out beautifully for our family, for the people that we met, but also as I, my son was AJ. So he was six at that point. And I have used my OT brain every single day as we were moving through with him. I have three kids total. My oldest is now going into her sophomore year. So she's 15 or she'll be 15 next week. Excuse me. And then my middle guy is 12. And then my youngest bringing up the rear here is seven. He'll be eight in October. So he knows nothing different from homeschooling. He was one when we started, but the rest, you know, had a little bit of public school and then now moving on through, through homeschooling. And it is just, it's been a joy, but absolutely using my OT brain, like I said. So after we were homeschooling for a couple of years, I realized there were just people who were asking the same questions to me, just as, you know, homeschool mom, where they knew that I was an occupational therapist before a lot of questions about sensory processing, a lot about executive functioning, a lot about handwriting, a lot about like, how can I get my kid to sit, which you don't necessarily have to, but that's a whole other subject. <laughs> anyway, so I realized at that point that there was definitely a need in our community. And so that was 2019. And we've been kind of progressing homeschool OT since then. I love that. Well, I'm glad you're back. And I'm glad that you've agreed to keep coming back because like you said, there's so much that Mm -hmm. occupational therapy helps and so much that we run into in our homeschool. And there are so many families out there who are homeschooling because their kids 
yes. wouldn't necessarily fit in a typical classroom. And a lot of that comes down to the things that we do, you do as an occupational therapist to help, you know, it, it's, it's what makes homeschooling so great is because yes. it's a natural adaptation and accommodation mm -hmm. for those needs that we usually go to an OT office for. I remember, I remember thinking when Logan started occupational therapy all those years ago, I was just telling mm -hmm. Sarah that yesterday she turned 14 and, and so she was itty bitty when she was going to occupational therapy and physical therapy and therapy therapy. And we were, you know, doing appointment after appointment after appointment. And all of our birthday and Christmas gifts were centered around tools that we yeah. could use to extend the occupational therapy at home because it was fun for her. But I was so grateful during that time, number one, that I had been encouraged to go to occupational therapy because I hadn't with my oldest and he could have benefited from it. And number two, that I was homeschooling her to be able to give her the space she needed to kind of grow into those, those senses. So we're going to talk today about sensory processing challenges. Do you want to tell us a little bit about like kind of what that overall big topic is, and then we'll narrow it down further? Yes, absolutely. So in general, let's just first, I think we need to define what occupation is because that matters too. And so then we can kind of think about what um, sensory processing and how they have to they go together. So occupation is anything and everything that occupies your time. So that's going to be different for, you know, you and me, and it's different for, you know, Joe Schmo down the street, um, because everybody does different things. But what we want is to be successful in what you need and want to do. So that can be everything from taking a shower, from getting dressed, from writing, from, you know, participating in sports, you know, it encompasses all of what we saw, your ADLs, your, which is your activities of daily living or that getting dressed type of thing, all the way to what you do for fun and work and all of that together. So when we're thinking about when would you go to occupational therapy or when would you need that, it's when you have a struggle with what you need and want to do and what you are able to do. So that struggle in there is where we say, okay, can I need, do I need help and what can I do? So one, then an occupational therapist looks at, okay, what are the skills within the person? What do we need to do to the environment? Are there some changes we can make there or within that occupation or, you know, activity that you're trying to do? Today, what we're going to talk about is sensory processing. So that is one of those things within the person. And there are eight senses, most of which you know are common and you probably heard, you know, in school and you're like, what I see, what I feel, what I touch, you know, those basic, what I smell, what I taste, you know, those are your basic ones are less common. So they are proprioception, which is knowing where your body is in relationship to itself. So knowing, you know, my arm is up, my arm is down. It's taking all the information from your environment that you are touching or feeling through your joints and muscles. So not just like what you feel with your fingers or touching, but what you actually take in with a movement, right? A lot of people will hear heavy work. That is a big, having exactly to do with proprioception. So because the heavier something is, the more information that it gives you about where your body is and what your body is doing. So, and that is the most calming sense. Another sense that is very common that you, well, that you hear us talk about, but you may not really, it didn't come up in your elementary school. What are my senses? <laughs> so that's the vestibular sense. And that is where your body is in space. So different from proprioception where your body is in relationship to itself, but where it is in relationship to space. So knowing like I'm standing up, or, you know, I'm spinning around. It's the sense is really taken in through your inner ear. It's where your head is positioned. You know, I'm upside down, backwards, spinning, all of that. It's the fluid moving around in your inner ears. And that is actually your most alerting sense. So when you see kids who are spinning or rocking, most of the time they're helping to alert their sensory system so that they can attend to what's happening. And then the last one is called interoception. And I want to tell you that the research on interoception is really brand new within the last, I would say, five to 10 years. If you're looking for some information on this, there's two names I want to give you. Kara Kosinski, who actually is another homeschool mom. Uh, and I have talked to her on several occasions. She's absolutely fantastic and very knowledgeable about interoception. And then Kelly Mailer, and she um, has written several books on interoception. And what these 
what that sense is, is understanding what's going on internally. So knowing I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I have to go to the bathroom, even understanding some things about your emotions. You know, what do I feel inside? So those three senses are the less common ones that you know about, right? But actually have such a huge impact on our day-to-day life and what we're, if we're able to participate in what we need and want to do. Love that. That that was such a great breakdown. And I think that so many times it's it's explained, you know, those different senses are explained in a way that makes it more cumbersome to understand. And yeah. I just really liked how you broke that down super simply. So a couple of things, for those of you listening, that was a lot of information. Yes. And yeah. we're going like, um, to, <laughs> yeah, they're just like, bring that all in and internalize it and you're all good. We're going to uh, make sure that those names are in the show notes, links to their resources and their books and their websites if they have them. And uh, I actually, as I'm recording and listening, I'm going to pull kind of that just nitty gritty, like nutshell description mm-hmm. into a PDF that you can download on the show notes so that, and it'll have Sarah's contact information on that too, so that you can ask questions if you need to. So that way you don't have to like be frantically writing as you're listening. Cause I know a lot of podcast listeners, me included, will pop my earbuds in while I'm like doing laundry or whatever. Yeah. So Watch just go to the show notes yeah. for this episode and you can find the show notes for all episodes on the podcast at raisinglifelearners.com slash podcast. And you'll be able to find it there and you'll be able to download it easily so you can remember those mm-hmm. that kind of breakdown. And then you can also find links to what Sarah just said, those people, those resources, as well as any others she gives me. And then anything else we talk about for the rest of the episode, because this is going to be, I can already tell, it's jam-packed, chock-full episode. Jam-packed. So when Sarah and I were initially talking about putting together this this episode, and again, we have we talked about a whole bunch of topics and probably could do an entire like season uh, together. So we are going to, in a way, and just kind of intersperse <laughs> it. But when, when it comes to sensory processing challenges, whether it's sensory processing disorder or Mm -hmm. some of the challenges that you actually just have with, with maybe certain ones, but it doesn't affect every aspect of your life. So it wouldn't be classified as, or considered a disorder. Apples don't fall far from trees, right? We talk about that all the time on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And when I'm speaking in person, if you've got a neurodivergent kiddo, you probably are, or have a spouse who is neurodivergent in some way. Yes, there is nature and there is nurture when it comes to (laughs) child development, but there, everything starts with the nature part of it. Right. And so If you have a propensity towards something, then somebody in your family is likely to also, whether yours has shown itself or not. I feel that I hear over and over again, and I I feel it personally, that the more we as parents discover about our kids, the more we actually discover about ourselves. Yes. Especially like you were saying, Sarah, because some of this research is so new Mm -hmm. that in the brain is, is such an, in the brain and the body, but the brain in particular is so fascinating and interesting. And it's really still an uncharted landscape, right? We're still learning and we don't know what we don't know. So as we discover these new things that have been kind of like researched in recent decades about Mm -hmm. how the brain works and are able to help our kids more, we are learning, number one, maybe like some of the things that we did in the past weren't our fault or weren't us being bad or didn't deserve to be punished or whatever, or were missed diagnoses. And whether we go and actually seek out those diagnoses now as we're older or not, we can still help ourselves. So Sarah and I are going to focus the conversation today on you, mom, because this episode is airing at the start of a school year. And whether you're coming back and binging on replays, you know, down the road or not, this is still good information. And for homeschooling parents who are with their kids all the time and have some of those similarities with quirky kids, it can be really challenging at times because their behaviors or actions or characteristics can trigger your own behaviors and actions and characteristics. And if we don't figure out how to regulate ourselves while helping our kids learn how to regulate themselves we will just continue to go in a downward spiral where we're each triggering each other ad nauseum, right? And so Sarah really wants to talk to us today. And I'm so excited about this because we have this struggle in our house about, you know, co-regulating and about our own regulation as parents as we're tackling this new school year. 
We are going to come back in the next episode. We talk about, talk with each other and talk about how you can help your kids regulate. We've talked about that on the podcast before. There's resources on Sarah's site, which we'll link to in the show notes. But today we're going to focus on us as parents. So I'm going to turn this over to you, Sarah, and let's, let's just dive in. Yes. All right. So when we're thinking about us as parents, you know, you talked a little bit about, for sure, the apple doesn't far, far, far fall from the, oh my goodness, I can't say that. Far, fall, far from the There we tree. go. We got it. Oh. But they're also in the difference between sensory processing and sensory integration. Okay. So another term I'm going to throw out here at you. So sensory processing is just taking in the information that you get from all of those senses that we have, right? That we already mentioned. Sensory integration is then being able to organize them so that you are either alert, you're overwhelmed, you're just like groggy and underwhelmed, you know, being able to take in all of that information and be, and use it. Have you ever felt like, by the end of the day, and you've got your kids running around and you're trying to homeschool, plus you've got to make dinner, plus you've got, you know, all these things that are happening and you kind of feel like your skin is going to fall off, right? <laughs> I have felt that very much myself. And the answer is that the brain and the body are so very connected. So when we're thinking about processing and integrating all of this, all everything that's coming at us from around our environment, we have to think about are we able to take it all in and be calm and organized in an alert state? Okay, so a really good kind of description, if you've ever heard of the Zones of Regulation program, I, I really enjoy that one. I think it's a great, just a, a great descriptor of sensory integration. So the alertness that we need. And that program, they're actually, we can link this in the show notes too. I wrote a blog for them a couple of years ago. Um, on how we use that program within our own homeschool. So we can link that one there. But when we think about that, they use colors, but basically there's the blue zone, which is when you are kind of groggy, you're waking up, you're, um, or think about like after Thanksgiving dinner, when you're like, oh, I can't get another thing. I'm just bleh. The green zone is when you're alert, you're able to focus, you're in it with your kids. You know, you're like sitting down for math and whether or not they're having a hard time with it, you are like, I don't care. I'm in. Like The lights are comfortable. There's not, not too many noises happening. I just feel great. I'm helping you. And we're, we're at this dance that, and I'm, I'm here for you. Yellow is when you're starting to feel a little bit more overwhelmed. Maybe sometimes it's things like someone's been touching you all day or there's been so much noise that's happening and it's just starting to really get to you. And then red is when you're just done. You know, you are overwhelmed. You cannot take in any more information. You are not feeling organized, right? So that's a good way to describe um, how you are, how you've been able to take all this sensory information and process it and organize it within your body. So. When we're thinking about us as adults, I like to think of, all right, so if we've got a cup here, right, and there is, we're thinking about what's happening in a moment, right? So there is, maybe there's a lot of sound going on around you because you have really loud kids, which um, happens a lot to me, although they're remarkably quiet today, <laughs> but I don't know if that's good or bad, but so there's maybe a lot of sound going on. The lights are bright wherever you are, or, and you haven't been able to move. You know, as soon as you woke up, there was kids all around you and you couldn't, you know, go outside or walk around or anything like that. And it, it, things keep filling up your cup and filling up your cup until it overflows. And that puts you up into the red zone. So what we have to think about is how we as parents, you know, if you're in the red zone, are you able to really calm your own kids? Are you able to focus with them on you know, their education or, or even just playing with them? Probably not because you're up here in that red zone. So what can we do ourselves to stay in that green zone? And guys, there is not a person in the world who wakes up in the green zone, stays in the green zone all the day, <laughs> you know, is time for bed at night. And you're like, oh, that was easy. We all have sensory, what we call quirks, right? So meaning things like when I wake up in the morning, I automatically pull up a hood. Like I, I put on a, a hoodie shirt and I go outside and I walk around for a little bit. And this, I did not realize this about myself until I was an OT. And then I said, huh, that's funny that I do that. But I need it to be more quiet when I get up. And I also, it kind of blocks out a little bit of what I'm seeing too. It just, it provides me a lot of comfort. There's people who wake up and put on a heavy bathrobe or something. What you're doing is calming your, making sure your nervous system stays calm until you're ready. 
people who wake up and then they drink coffee to help get into that green zone. Sometimes it is the taste, but it's oftentimes also the smell, the touch, you know, of that whole thing. It's just the experience that helps to move you into the green zone. Also, when, you know, we're sitting here having a conversation and I'm actually, I do this all the time. I'm rubbing my foot on the bottom of my desk. You know, it helps to keep me alert. It's keeping you in that green zone. So you likely have a lot of these quirks that you're doing. When we have this, or not quirks necessarily, but sometimes compensatory strategies or just strategies that you're doing to help keep yourself in that green zone. What we need to be attentive to is as our demands change, you know, we're moving back into the fall, we're moving back into maybe some more rhythm and routine. Are we giving ourselves enough of what we need specifically to then be able to give to our kids? Are we organizing ourselves enough? And that looks very different for when you have little kids and when you have older kids, right? So I now, I do, I still put on my hit, my hood, but I take my dog for a walk every morning. There was a long time when I couldn't just leave my kids in the morning and be like, see ya, I'm going out for a walk. So we have to think about the things that we can do with our kids and what we can do without them. When I was with them, you know, when I could not leave to walk, you know, go for a walk in the morning, which is still like every day, they can, they'll even say the same thing. They can tell a huge difference when I have some time to myself in the morning versus when I don't. Um, it's the reason I became more of an early bird. Um, I, I'm up at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and when I couldn't, then what I would do is a, a gym class on the, you know, on TV or whatever, YouTube, so that I would make sure that I would get some heavy work in. With that said, though, there was also a time in that where I was like, if I don't get this number of minutes, then it's going to be a problem. And that so much was, I was putting the, my emphasis on the amount of time versus just more of like, this is something that I do. You know, you get up and do five squats, you're getting some heavy work. You get up and do, you know, a, an hour long class, you're getting some heavy work. No one says what's right or wrong. It's what you actually need. It's when I was giving myself this certain amount of time to, it was quantity versus quality. So I would caution you against that. Like, don't tell yourself, I have to have this to make, you know, to be able to then focus on my kids, but more of like, I need a rhythm of some heavy work to get started with the day. And that really allows, you know, the cups that I was talking about, it allows you to add more into it, but we've already started off with like an empty cup instead of starting off with a really mediocre or halfway full one. Then, you know, thinking about as we're moving through our day, what other times in the day do you tend to need more either sensory information because you're feeling groggy or you need some things that are relaxing and help you to calm down? So we started, I actually don't remember I, whether it was Sarah, it might've been Sarah McKinsey um, that, did, that talked about this at the very beginning when I, I can't say my source, but <laughs> whoever it was <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> talked about a lit lunch, right? So it was lighting a candle at lunchtime um, and reading literature or listening to a um, podcast or listening to books um, at lunchtime. And that has worked wonders for me and for our family because what it does is it takes away that sensory of our visual fluorescent lights, which are very abrasive, right? So it took that away and we would eat by candlelight. We're just listening quietly to, to a book, which then made it so that my kids were not, you know, when, I, when at that point I was like, oh, I need to, I need some calm. But we would listen and just eat together and it kind of centered us all again but then made it so that we would be ready for, for the afternoon. So these are things that have worked out for me. It's adding in some heavy work, but also trying to limit some of the other senses that are that can be overwhelming and thinking about a language within our home to help to communicate about our sensory needs. Hey there. Okay, so if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, you know how grateful I am to CTC Mac. Not only is CTC Math our season-long sponsor, in fact, they've jumped on for another year. They're so supportive of Raising Lifelong Learners and all of the topics and content that we bring to you. And it just allows us to continue to bring you great resources and guests and topics that can help you in your homeschooling differently wired kiddos journey. 
but CTC is the math program that I use and love with my kids. I am not only sponsored by them here, but I am a subscriber. I'm, I am a paying subscriber. I have been purchasing my subscription for the last several years, and I am a customer. I believe in CTC math. I love it. It is what we use in our home. But you don't have to take my word for it. I thought it would be fun to share with you an email that I got recently. So first, just in case you're new to this, if you don't know, CTC Math is an online math curriculum that's perfect for homeschoolers, especially homeschoolers who have kiddos of different ability levels because they do the teaching for you, but you get access in your subscription to all the grade levels. So your kids can hop around as needed, they can accelerate through if they need to, they can go back for some remediation in certain areas if they need to, but it's just great. Okay, I have to share this email with you. Sandy wrote, Colleen, thank you. Since you first highlighted this program, we have been using it with great success. Well, I say great success, but math still gives us what we call the math yawns. Still, math is happening, and I'm folding laundry and chiming in with good luck with your questions in my best Aussie accent. It is a terrific tool for us. My kids love it, and so do I. So thank you for sharing. Just in case you don't know, CTC Math is based in Australia, so yes, the lessons are taught with an Australian accent and we love it because my kids think it's so cool to be taught in this beautiful, rich accent. But they're learning and they're accelerating at their own pace and you don't have to just take my word for it. You can take Sandy's word for it too. And if you're a listener and you've tried CTC Math, I would love it if you would let me know how it's working for you. Just shoot us an email or a voicemail message. You can go over to RaisingLifelongLearners.com forward slash podcast. And on any of the show notes page, there is a link to a voicemail widget. There is also a link to the contact form, which goes directly to my email. All right. Check out CTCMath.com. Thank them for sponsoring the content here. And check them out because they are a phenomenal, phenomenal program. Okay, let's get back to today's episode. I think those are great ideas and it's important for us to remember as parents, right? We have to, we have to be cognizant of as, and this is something that I can cite that Sarah McKenzie says, we're going to be in our homeschool the longest. We are the ones who are going to be here until the last person leaves. So it has to be doable for us or it's not going to get done or we're going to be burnt out or we're going to be like watching the school bus go by and be totally yeah. ready to throw them on it. And so if we're not taking care of our own sensory needs and our own mental health, then mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to do what we need to do as parents and especially as homeschooling parents. And it feeds into, and there's an episode we'll link to a past episode about self-care where self-care gets a bad rap, right? That it's like That's, all about yes. bubble baths mm -hmm. and chocolate and going out, you know, yourself. Getting my nails done. <laughs> it, right. And the thing is that self-care is just knowing what you need and taking care of it. And being able to articulate it, which comes to that last point that you made, that uh, cannot be overstated. Um, right. Communication is the key to all of this. Connecting with your kids through communication. Um, when you're talking about what your kids' needs are, you're taught you're helping them understand how their bodies work. But you can mm -hmm. do that too in relation to how your body works, yes. so that they know everybody has needs, and everybody's needs are just as important as theirs. And we can't, you know, we don't live in isolation. We were talking about this in respect to other things before, but like that idea of disagreeing with people, right? It would be a really boring place to live if everybody had the exact same opinions and the exact same needs Me. and the exact same skill sets. And so this is a great life lesson for our kids to know that, you know, they may need constant stimulation and conversation, but you don't. In fact, right. you need the opposite. You need time for quiet and reflection and to recharge and knowing that we all have those different needs and communicating those to our kids empowers them to be able to communicate yes. their needs to us and see us taking care of ourselves. Um, one of the things that I said live that I don't think I say enough on the podcast or even in um, articles and stuff on the site, it was kind of an epiphany I came to a year or two ago when I was speaking live to parents and having that conversation about how important it is to take care of ourselves too and cultivate our own interests and uh, respect our own needs. Uh, we are the only 
complete example of what a healthy adulthood looks like to our kids. Yes. If not modeling that in a way that they can internalize, then they're not going to be healthy adults themselves because they only see a portion of everybody else's adulthood. They might right. think that their best friend's dad is a better dad or their best friend's mom has it all together. Um, but they only see, just like we only see snippets on Instagram, they only see what the the public version of their friend's parents are. They see the public and the private version of us. Mm. And so if we're not modeling what a well-rounded and healthy adulthood looks like and how to, to what taking care of yourself as a mother looks like, yes. our daughters are going to grow into moms who burn themselves out. And aren't, mm -hmm. you know, managing their own needs as well as their kids' needs. If we're, if our husbands, our spouses aren't modeling what um, fatherhood looks like in a healthy way, our boys aren't going to understand what it means to be a healthy mentally and physically father. Okay. And crossing those lines, our girls aren't going to know what a healthy relationship looks like. And they're not going to look for a spouse um, or a relationship that honors them and respects them in all of their needs. And our sons okay. aren't going to know what a healthy wife and marriage looks like. It's up to us to model the future we want for our kids by giving ourselves the healthy balance of motherhood and parenthood. Yes. And permission to do so for sure. Mm -hmm. And here's, so here we are, we're telling you, not only is that permissive, right? Yes, make it happen but that it's needed. You know, mm -hmm. we, if we, again, are not taking care of ourselves, we cannot really help our, our children in that manner. So, and there's a, a term for that called co-regulation, which really means if you think about, you know, you walk into a room and maybe you're going, I don't know, maybe it's somebody else's house or whatever, but they've been in an argument and you can feel that tension, right? So you either have the option of like you then become tense and you're moving up into that yellow and red zone, or, you know, you have skills within yourself to keep yourself in that green zone. And you can kind of watch that deescalate a little bit. And that's, it's like a, a dance moving back and forth. If you think about with your babies, like when you're tiny, when they're teeny tiny, and they have really no chance of, co of regulating themselves. They're too little to understand that. Um, of what I need. They just have some very basic, like primitive, I need to eat <laughs> kind of things. But we help them to regulate their bodies. We start to bounce or to to move side to side, that rocking that is triggering their vestibular system. So we're naturally doing some of these things for our kids when they're regulating from us, then that doesn't change when they get older. It just looks differently. So we may not be you know, picking up our kids and rocking them back and forth. I, I would the thought actually makes me laugh because two of my <laughs> kids are giant next, you know, <laughs> taller than me at this point. If I was like, oh, we need to rock, but, but we do give them hugs. We do talk to them in, in a lower voice, you know, that can help them to kind of deescalate that situation. But to be able to do that, if we are dysregulated, you know, we're up here in the red zone, then they're having to help us. And, you know, everyone's escalating. It's, it's not working. Right. So we have to be able to know what helps us individually to get back in that green zone, to calm, to um, stay regulated. There is a, and we can link this in the show notes too. There is a free survey. I think it's on sensational brain. I'll make sure that I give that to you. Okay. That just helps to you to know your own sensory quirks or what does help you or what does overwhelm you. There was a very long time that this wasn't talked about. And especially when we just had to figure out, you know, we have to one, two, three eyes on me in school and say, you know, sit on your desk and whatever, where we ignored our internal signals quite often. And so now we're looking as adults, wait, <laughs> there's more to me, you know, than just being able to stay still. And so how can I regulate so that I can have good conversation and so that I can help my kids and so that we can, now we're looking at ourselves as, as educators, but also just learning through life. We have to get through that life, right? Yeah. And we have to help our kids know how to get through their own lives by showing them as that, that demonstrate honoring and respecting ourselves. I remember a time, so we, we live in a, a beautiful house now. It's a nice colonial on four acres. We have chickens, my husband's pandemic project that now Same. three years later is still going. <laughs> but before that, we sold the house that my husband and I had bought, you know, over our means, like a lot of young couples do. 
and bought um, a fixer upper that we had intended to flip and live in to pay off bills and save up for property. And we ended up staying there for seven years. It was a 490 square foot house and we had four kids. Woo! We moved in with three. I was pregnant soon after we moved in. And then by the time we left, it was 900 square feet because we had fixed up the upstairs. But we lived in that tiny space in order to reach our future goals. Right. Yeah, it was it was really difficult, especially as a family who has a lot of sensory challenges. And mm -hmm. there was a, a period of time when it was so loud. I mean, and, and you can imagine a homeschooling family, work at home, mom and four kids, the stuff we had, right, in, in mm -hmm. that small space. And the stuff would be overwhelming. The noise would be overwhelming. The day would be overwhelming. And we had a little, little, little is the operative word, gazebo in the backyard. And mm -hmm. there was a rocking chair on that gazebo. And there were many, many times that I would put on, you know, Curiosity Stream or some other kind of streaming service and tell the kids, I need to go outside and rock and be alone for a few minutes. I will come at your job is to stay in here. You can play yeah. quietly, you can watch the show, but you cannot come out to find me unless there is an emergency. And that includes blood or fire or, you know, we would, <laughs> yes. what they could do, what they need, what they could interrupt me for. And I would go outside and, you know, they, they knew that I, I would come back when I was regulated, when I was ready, we didn't use the term re regulated, but that I needed a break mentally mm -hmm. and physically. And that in short of an emergency, they needed to stay inside and this was their time to do something with each other. And I needed a, a time alone. And I would, I would, and I would see little faces like in the back window, checking to see I was really in the backyard, <laughs> but they respected that. And they now as big kids, right? We've been here now three years. So we were there seven. Yeah. So this is like, you know, eight, seven years ago and they're 20 and 16 and 14, my big kids. And they will ask me if I need a hug or if yeah. I need time away. They, right. they can see because I've shown them that when I need time and when my body needs something, I'm taking it and they do the same. And then they can also respect that, oh, she might not need a hug. And I kind of want a hug. Right. Can I give you a hug? So that, the, that open communication is so important. And that modeling is so important because it leads to them being able to recognize it in themselves and others. Mm -hmm. And and then it, it allows them to be more compassionate and to be kind of advocates for each other. One yes. more story about that, because I actually just remembered as we were talking my daughter, my older daughter is in a show right now. And I've talked on this podcast before about my younger daughter who just turned 14 with her anxiety and her sensory processing mm -hmm. disorder and all of the challenges and other letters she has mm -hmm. identified mm -hmm. different challenges. And there was a time several years ago when she really, really struggled. And it would be up to the rest of the family, the siblings and me, mm -hmm. my husband, to kind of recognize and help her regulate herself and mm -hmm. rub her back or, or whatever. And she had brushing, you know, that the, her yes, OT yeah. had um, given us because she really needed that input. But sometimes her anxiety would just spike to a point where she'd be verbalizing, like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And talking yeah. through it. And my oldest has been in a play recently. She's always in a play. But there is a girl in the show with her who is younger and about the age that my Logan was several years ago and looks similarly and obviously without talking about it, has some sensory challenges and some anxiety. And Molly has witnessed her off stage going, it's going to be fine. I'm going to be able to do this. And um, mm -hmm. she comes home and as she's describing this girl, she has tears in her eyes because she's yeah. remembering her sister several years ago and like, can yeah. see how far she's come. And then not only does she have that sentimental tie and that emotion and pride in how far her sister's yeah. come, but she's able to help that little girl in her cast. She's got some empathy for regulate. sure. Knowledge where 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 she can help and where she can be, where she can co-regulate with yeah. her. That's and cool. it's because she's watched me allow myself the time. And we've modeled that compassion and empathy within the family, but you know, with the adults as well as the kids. So it's yeah. so important. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're going to talk, I think, in the next one about like sibling relationships and that, because mm -hmm. it's actually funny when you're saying, my son is the complete opposite. So he's a sensory seeker and he uh -huh. needs all the movement and all the noise and all like all the things to get into that green zone, right? To be, to be ready to be alert. And that can take on something that's very difficult. But coming along with that, he has a lot of stuff 
a lot of, you know, all over the place. He, cause he goes from one thing to the next, the next. And for my husband, when he walks in from, from work at the end of the day, he, his sensory needs, he needs calm in order. A lot of visual stimuli to him just takes him from that, like green zone straight up into the red. Like he just gets so overwhelmed by stuff. So we really, as a family, we, we talk about that, you know, that it's a, okay that dad needs that. You know, it's, it's okay that we can help and we can pick up some stuff around the house before he we know he gets home. I've heard people in the past be like, wait, so you tell your kids that they have to clean up before dad gets home? And I'm like, yeah, because we're a family. <laughs> we relate together. And so one person's sensory needs aren't more important than another's just because he's an adult. We want this to be a welcoming home for all of us. Mm -hmm. So it's important to recognize what is it that you need and say, that's, a, that's okay. It's okay even if I am an adult. And sure, we can say things like, well, you're an adult. You should be able to handle it. Okay, so one day if we don't you know, pick up before he gets home, it's not like our house has to be spotless before he right. gets home. But it's our way of letting him know, like we acknowledge this with you. And sure, he is an adult and would have other coping skills to handle the situation. But we also, I would like to spend my evening like hanging out and calm rather than <laughs> scurrying around trying to pick up once he gets here. And then he's already, you know, up here in, in, in that yellow zone. And that just doesn't leave us for a good evening. So if there are specific routines or um, ways that you can set up during your day to modify the environment, um, that's also something to think about. So I guess my main kind of takeaways from here would be for yourself to really know what you need and that that quiz can can be helpful. And so that's kind of within yourself. And then think about what can we do within the environment to help you. Sometimes people need music playing all the time. Sometimes people need a really quiet house. Sometimes people need things picked up. Sometimes they don't. You know, so really think about what your environment is and how you can help to set that up. And then the last one is how you're going to communicate about that within your home. So I mentioned the Zones of Regulation program. There's also another one called the Alert program, which is a little bit more concrete. You know, you pick animals or you pick your kids are into cars or whatever. You know, I feel like right now I'm, I don't know, a, a sloth or a, a cat or a cheetah, you know, so you're kind of moving. It's how your engine runs or, you know, if you're thinking about cars that way, um, which can be a, a good way to communicate about those needs too. Yeah. We, Logan's OT did that with her and the alert it program. was a, is this a stubbed toe challenge mm. or is it like your house has burned down around you? You know, yeah. like yeah. that kind of level and how, how quickly do we need to actually solve this problem and how can you right. work through it? And we always, we still say that, is this a stubbed toe problem or did your house just, like, <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. We, so we're definitely going to come back and we're going to talk about kids and about families and about those different sensory needs and how to manage that. But moms who are listening or, or dads, if you're the home, the primary homeschooler, but for the, the primary caregiver, the person who is home the most with, with the kids and doing the most things and doing the running around and the organizing of the calendar and the school year and the, the day-to-day -day running of things, I make sure that you are doing what Sarah has said, you know, take that quiz, know what you need know how your environment needs to look in order to facilitate those needs and communicate those needs to your kids and your spouse so you're all on the same page because it will help you stay in your homeschool as long as yes. you need to stay in your right. homeschool get through all of your kids and it will help your days go more smoothly. Now, anybody who has kids like this, right? Mm -hmm. With quirks, anybody who has quirks of their own, your homeschool is not going to be rainbows and sunshine all the time. So you need to know that, nope. that you're going to trigger each other. You're going to trigger them. They're going to trigger you. And so you need these things in place, these ideas in place to come back to, to remind yourself that you can do it and it's worth it. And that you are the absolute best person for your kids. Um, and they're the absolute best kids for you. You guys are yes. meant to be. You're so equipped for, to handle your own kiddos. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So before we end today's episode, Sarah, we talked last time you were on 
about executive function skills. And um, you've got some resources on your site for that. And we had shared a coupon code. That coupon code is still valid for all of the executive function skills things, the um, focus group and the book, the book club. But do you want to talk about what you've also added to that coupon code and then reiterate what the coupon code is? Absolutely. So the coupon code is RLL15. So it's like raising lifelong learners, but R15 and it's for 15% off. And I have a, what I call focus groups at this point, because they are a deep dive into whatever topic it is. So the last time I talked about executive functioning. And so we gave that coupon code for that. This is the sensory balanced homeschool is what we call it. Um, and so it is designed over a month long because it can be overwhelming to get all of this information. But what happens is each week you get more information as far as um, sensory processing. It's all things with that. So the first week or two is just about um, what are each of these systems. And so it goes more in depth than what I did in this, you know, 15 minutes at the beginning or five minutes, we talked about the definitions. Then there are ideas to indoor and outdoor to actually use or to accommodate your sensory needs to promote that sensory integration. There are I'm trying to think of what else is in there because I haven't done it myself in a while. There also is more about communication. There's an interview with Kara Kosinski that I taught that I told you about before. So that one's all about interoception. So it's just chock full of information, but then also practicality and ways to help within your homeschool. And again, designed over a month long, but it is life, you have lifelong access. So if you like get it and then you start, you know, going through some things and each week you're getting new emails and you're like, okay, I can't right now. I'm in the red zone guys. Fine. <laughs> Come back when you, when you can over the rest of your life. Also, your kids' needs are going to change. Your needs are going to change. So it might be that you need to come back and revisit and and learn, you know, wait, now my child is, you know, a teenager, but we're having a a, a hard time with sleeping or whatever. You know, sensory processing pays, plays into all of those things. So um, I love that. And I absolutely. love that there's lifetime access because it is important to give yourself the grace to step back and then come back to it. That's kind of why in in the lab, you know, that we have the community that we have, the learner's lab, we put the archives of all the past content because yes. some months you're going to get to everything. Some months you're not going to get to anything, but yep. have access to all the past. And in some months you have extra time and you want to yep. do some more focused work. So you could go do multiple things. Yes. And so this you can come back to. And I know for from experience, our needs have changed. Logan graduated right. from in-person OT, but there are new things that come up with puberty, right. with changes in, in, you know, who she is. And so we've got to revisit content like that all the time and resources mm -hmm. like that. So that is great. And I can't wait to talk about just the multiple sensory needs in a family and how to manage that in, in your homeschool the next time we talk. So thank you again for being here. I appreciate it. A pleasure for sure. And then for those of you listening, thank you for listening. I know there's lots and lots and lots of things that you can spend your time on. So I appreciate you for links to all of the different things that Sarah talked about and to the past episode with her and other episodes that touch on these topics. You can go to the show notes at raisinglifelonglearners.com slash podcast. And then you can always reach out. There's a, there's a contact form link, a voicemail link on the um, podcast show notes, and there's a contact form on the site. So reach out anytime you have questions, anytime you have ideas for other episodes, topics, I mean, other things I can pick Sarah's brain about because we'll just keep bringing her back. And, and as always, thanks to our sponsors. So check them out as well. Have a great day. I appreciate you all.